You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Bitcoin, Ether, Ripple, Litecoin, and more. Cryptocurrencies and other digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity. Provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week, we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends, and developments on everything from coins to tokens, futures, and even OTC options. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on the Crypto Rundown. This program is brought to you by Genesis Volatility, also known as GVOL, home of institutional-grade crypto options analytics. Whether you're trading CFI options or DeFi options, cryptocurrencies move. Use GVOL Analytics to analyze implied volatility, model realized volatility, structure positions, and unlock alpha. For more information, visit gvol.io. That's G-V-O-L dot I-O. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time for the Crypto Rundown. everybody that music means it is time once again for the crypto rundown the program here on the options insider radio network where we go beyond our traditional stomping grounds of your volatility and your spy and your apples and your teslas and all that other fun stuff and look a little bit farther afield see what's going on in the crypto landscape going to talk the volume the volatility the skew the oi all that fun stuff and a whole bunch more my name is mark longo from the optionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the aforementioned network. Pleased to see so many of you are having fun there in the coolest secret club in the world of options. You want to learn more for yourselves, figure out what the heck I'm talking about, and join us live throughout the week for this show and everything else that we do here on the network, plus the exclusive shows for you folks in the secret club. You know where to go, the optionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go to learn more, kick the tires, and light the fires. And, of course, wherever you listen, live or you're after the fact, on demand, on the legion of devices out there, keep rating and reviewing the show. It really does help all the folks in the world of crypto discover an options-oriented network out there. Maybe some folks who are new to the world of options. It's great to see the influx of newcomers we have all the time to a show like this, a little bit outside of our core audience, which is always fun. And of course, keep those questions coming, too. We do love to hear from all of you out there. Let's see who we're hearing from today. It is time to roll out the crypto hot seat. Forget about cold storage. It's time to turn up the heat on thought leaders from the world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time to take their place on the The crypto Crypto hot Hot seat. seat. All right, everybody. Welcome to the crypto hot seat, the portion of the show where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of crypto derivatives and indeed beyond to proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you the listeners and next up on the hot seat is a newcomer to the program and indeed to the network he is robert materazzi the ceo at luca robert welcome to the crypto rundown program hi mark thanks for having me and robert as we are want to do with all of our first timers here on the network why don't you go ahead give our audience a bit of your background in the financial indeed crypto space and 
It's been a while since we've checked in with you folks at Luca. In fact, I was looking right before the show here. The last time we chatted with you folks, we had Jeremy Drain, your chief commercial officer, on back in June of 2019. So it's been a few years and from a crypto and indeed from a global pandemic perspective, another lifetime ago. So a lot has happened since then. So maybe also catch our listeners up on what the heck it is you guys do at Luca, Robert. Sure. Yeah. So um, absolutely. A ton, has, a ton has changed since 2019. Um, so I joined uh, Luca uh, before we even changed our name to Luca in late, late 2018. I joined from PwC, uh, where I was in their financial services management consulting practice. I worked on a lot of large scale banking transformations, uh, many of which that stemmed from all the, the post financial crisis regulation. Um, and then in 2018, was introduced to Luca. I joined uh, not as CEO, um, and uh, but did about four different roles before being asked to be CEO. So this October, I will have been here for about three years. Um, and really, what Luca was beginning to do when I joined was to cater to some of the big institutions and, and the fund ecosystem, as there is a big trend of, of crypto funds being formed, um, and then uh, fund administrators, fund auditors. Um, all needed a solution so that they could satisfy traditional reporting requirements and pass audits and 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 do all the other things that um, that funds are required to do. Um, but it has to be done in a new way for crypto. So that's that's really what Luca focuses on: our middle and back office operations, um, and we solve them with solutions in the form of data products and software products that are of institutional quality. Like I mentioned, it's been a while since we checked in with you, just for some frame of reference, listeners, when we last checked in with Luca. Bitcoin was around 7,700 to around 8,000, the beginning of the end of the crypto winter and resurging again. Of course, it would take a little while to break that 10,000 level, and we all know what happened in the end of 2020 into 2021. So obviously, Robert, a lot has gone on. The crypto space has evolved quite a bit. Since the last time we chatted with you, I have to imagine the interest in a product like yours and an offering like yours has exploded, especially in the last six months. Maybe catch us up from that perspective. What's it been like on the fund servicing and, as you put it, the back office end? What kind of demand and interest have you been seeing in this since the last time we checked in with you guys? Yes, it's been very exciting. We, um, we've been preparing for what's been happening this year, so in 2021, for, for quite some time. I mean, even before I joined Luca. And we knew that once mainstream finance or financial institutions took crypto more seriously and were comfortable even using the word crypto, because honestly, in 2018, they weren't. We were major, mainly calling them digital assets. Um, we, we knew that Lucas Services would be critical in, in, in supporting them and getting their businesses launched. And so it's very exciting seeing that happen before our eyes. Um, you know, in my, in my opinion, it's the fund ecosystem, which has the lowest barriers to entry is getting some, some form of exposure to crypto, um, or any type of investment managers or, or anyone else that's managing, a some form of an investment portfolio. And, uh, and after they, they gain exposure to some of these assets, um, they'll call up some of their traditional providers, whether it's valuation services that they're looking to perform or reporting or fund administration. Um, or whatnot, they'll, they'll call up their traditional providers like a State Street or an S&P or whomever, and, uh, and we'll ask them if they can still cater to them now that they have crypto. And then that's usually where, where Luca comes into play. Um, and, uh, and we can support some of those traditional companies and, and help them get to market uh, very quickly. And so um, a, a very large portion of our customers today are funds directly um, fund administrators or fund auditors. Um, however, we do cater to really any business that has crypto because really uh, uh, anyone that has a crypto asset transaction on their on their balance sheet or that they're interacting with um, has the same challenges that the fund ecosystem has. Well, Robert, it's good timing that we have you on the show this week because, you know, traditionally back office, the plumbing side of the marketplace isn't usually the sexiest, most top of mind thing for a lot of folks listening to a show like this. But these days it is because, of course, we have that debate raging over the amendments to the infrastructure bill. And that will, of course, change a lot of the requirements and the reporting. And as you put it, kind of the back office slash plumbing uh, of the crypto space. Maybe let's start 
Robert, for any of our listeners who are not familiar with the nuances of what's going on, maybe a quick synopsis of the debate as it's currently raging in the Congress over the future of crypto as it's going to be viewed and indeed tax, and then B, maybe why some folks who haven't been paying attention to this should maybe start paying attention to it. Sure. So, I mean, my, my opinion on the infrastructure bill and some of the proposed amendments or those, you know, the feedback that we've seen in the press is really that, I mean, one, um, you know, I personally, I know, I know Luca supports responsible reporting, and it's absolutely critical that we figure this out for crypto assets, just like other assets. Um, you know, it helps us manage risk. It helps with transparency and fair reporting and, and whatnot. However, it has to be done in a way that, that's practical and isn't, uh, um, impermissible to to individuals or businesses. And that's really where the challenges come in because it's not a straightforward answer when it comes to crypto asset transactions. Um, the, the data that are associated with crypto assets or on blockchain um, are inherently much more complex and have very different characteristics than traditional transaction data. And, uh, and we need new next technology in order to perform reporting um, and then there's also new new methodologies. We need new laws. And, and I think often what we need to do, generally speaking, is we need to step back and look at the intents behind some of the rules that are in place today for traditional assets and help meet the same intents, but not necessarily do it the same way. Um, and so I don't think the bill as it's proposed is, is very practical. I think it puts too much burden on individuals, most likely, that might fit into some of the, the, the categories that they described. Um, and uh, and ultimately, um, we'll need to carve out a little bit more than like what the one proposed amendment said, which carved out mining situations to be to cover a lot more situations other than mining. So, um, so I think it definitely needs needs some work before it's productive. Um, but I do believe that the in, the intent of it is is going in the right direction. This is not the first time we've seen Congress look farther afield and say, oh, there's some gold in them, our hills. Let's find a way to mine it. <laughs> and really, the devil is in the details. We see this quite a bit in the derivative space as well. There's all these regular attempts to try to make some sort of transaction tax or something along those lines. So this is just crypto's first foray into those same waters. And you're right. There are very broad definitions. For example, in this current bill, they define what they term a broker. That's who they're looking to tax in these situations. Quote, any person who for consideration is responsible for regularly providing any service effectuating transfers of digital assets on behalf of another person. <laughs> That's so broad that anyone pretty much who, who hands or trades or gives a crypto to someone else pretty much could fall under that burden of tax and indeed regulatory reporting. So you're right, uh, Robert. This does seem like this is uh, the first kind of broad brush is it your view that you think this is going to get whittled down and we'll see something that makes a little bit more sense? Or you think we'll be dealing with these kind of broad strokes and maybe a bit of their effect in the near term on crypto, Robert? I do. I think, I, I mean, as this works its way through the rest of approvals and whatnot, I'm sure we're going to, I'm sure this is just the beginning. Um, and so um, try not to react too, too, too aggressively um, on, on this very first stab. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that as, as all parties that are involved educate or get educated more on, on these topics and the intricacies and we, and we challenge it, that this will get refined down to something that's more practical or I'm, I'm optimistic that it will be. That's good because you've heard some naysayers out there saying, oh, these pass in the way they are right now. We might see a flight of mining and funds and everyone else outside of the U.S. and outside of U.S. regulatory jurisdiction. Doesn't sound like you're quite that dire, Robert. No, exactly. I mean, if this did get passed as is, that's, that's what the side effect would be, or at least one of them, I think, is that's reasonable, is that we would see U.S. businesses maybe consider where where they want to be operating from, and, and that would not be good for us, for the industry, for the United States, or the world. So um, so I'm hoping it does not go in that direction. Um, but uh, but if, it isn't, if it isn't edited, it, I think that that's, that's likely some of the side effects that we would see. Well, unfortunately, we have been kind of lagging behind the rest of the world in this space for a little bit now. And you're right. If this if this passes in its very current broad form, we may indeed fall behind a little bit more as well. But let's step back from the current brouhaha out there right now, because I'm curious, Robert, you live in an interesting space in the crypto world as well, which is, of course, kind of the regulatory and tax reporting side. And for many people who hear that at first blush, they might think, wow, that's 
really contrary to the entire spirit of crypto. Why a lot of people got intrigued by this space to begin with was that it was supposed to be anonymous or at least pseudo anonymous. And now, Robert, you spend your days living in that gray area. We're trying to find that balance between the pseudo anonymity of crypto and also making it viable from a regulatory and reporting and a compliance perspective. So I'm curious from your perspective, Robert, you've been doing this for a little while. How difficult is it to walk that tightrope? Like, for example, when you approach a more crypto oriented client and say, hey, you need to have more of these types of reporting requirements, do they bristle a bit? Is there some pushback? And and on the other side, if you go to a more traditional financial services, a fund or those type of players who are used to this type of high level of compliance, are they maybe a little bit shocked at the lack thereof in the crypto space? So, so how difficult is it to walk that kind of fine line between the two? Yeah, you know what? Most of our, our customers and the institutional ones that, that, uh, that we cater to today um, uh, the the last thing that comes up is 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 them being anonymous and whatnot. I think that's a big misconception. There's there's a ton of businesses that have embraced KYC and AML procedures and and other things just like traditional businesses, and they're more attracted to the benefits that crypto asset investing offers and all the other strategies that come with it. I mean, being able to exchange one asset for another without cash in fractional quantities in a global marketplace. That's what the customers that Luca um, caters to stereotypically um, is attracted to with their businesses. So I, I don't really, there haven't been any challenges around that side of things. I think that that's definitely a very uh, um, now, thankfully, outdated way. I mean, I know it still exists out there, right? But but I'd say it, it really doesn't come up frequently. However, to your point, the, the reporting um, challenges absolutely are very present. And that's where where Luca um, looks to offer its solutions so that we can solve that for our customers. And people that are, or organizations, whether they're government agencies or, or institutions or individuals that are brand new to crypto and are diving into this for the first time, I say hey, they absolutely are shocked when they hear um, about the lack of standards and some of the intricacies that comes with all of this crypto um, behind the scenes. And... Uh, um, but thankfully, that's where, where our solutions solve most of it today. I'm curious for you, you guys handle the reporting in the back office for a lot of different funds out there trading a wide variety of assets. I'm sure the lion's share of them are in Bitcoin and in ETH these days. But whenever we have a guest on, they always bring up some interesting pockets of liquidity that they may notice out there. So I'm curious for you, Robert, as you're looking across your platform and all the various assets that are coming across it on a day-to-day basis. Have there been any interesting, maybe surprises to you where you scratch your chin and say, hmm, I didn't expect this particular small altcoin to be as popular as it is, or is it pretty much just all doge all the time, Robert? It is. Uh, so across <laughs> our institutional customer base, we support over 8,000 crypto assets. Um, and that is our normal course of business. So our, our data products and software accommodates that. Um, and so we've been catering to funds that have had, you know, we'll see individual funds with north of 600 assets in their single portfolio that they're um, accessing across over 30 different liquidity providers or, you know, whether, whether they're exchanges, OTC desks or, or, you know, however the business associates with them. So us dealing with a large spectrum of assets is, is totally normal. It's what we do every day. We encourage it, and we're we're constantly increasing our coverage in response to customer demand. Um, I'd say it's actually very rare that we do have only a Bitcoin or only Bitcoin ETH or a, or a very clean. You know, with with the the adoption of uh, of DEXs in the DeFi space and whatnot, particularly. I mean, we're just seeing um, really all participants access all different types of assets regularly. And we're, you know, that has new challenges to the reporting that we address one at a time. Um, but we try to stay agile and do it as quickly as possible. Interesting. So you're not just seeing, I won't call it plain vanilla, but, you know, your top two, your Bitcoins and your ETH. You'd say the majority of your clients are now participating beyond that, Robert. Oh, absolutely are and have been for many years. I'd say maybe some of the traditional financial institutions that are just getting into it this year might start off launching their businesses with, with a couple assets or a handful um as they as they roll things out quickly however the funds that have been trading crypto for a while and in the businesses um started trading way more than those common assets a a while ago 
and no particular assets spring to mind in terms of mm, these are interesting and perhaps not what I expected funds to be trading out there these days, Robert? No, I mean, you know, we see we, we do cater to customers that that, that trade a lot of derivatives. Um, you know, there's a lot of staking type investments um, in some of the new protocols that are going on. Um, I don't think anything that you wouldn't see anyone that's in crypto and watching some of the um, the traditional news with different participants. I don't think would be shocked by the assets that I would rattle off. I mean, it's, if you look at um, the most widely traded ones based on um, volume or, or market cap or any of those metrics, you're gonna you're gonna see the same ones that I would rattle off. So, um, I mean, we've already heard the, the you know the news on Doge and and the other ones and. Um, I mean, it started off as a joke and, and now is, I mean, at the end of the day, if someone can make a, a profit on it, um, it, sh- it should be considered and, uh, and we need to accommodate it. Yeah. It's not, it's not a joke if you're making money on it anymore, right? Well, Robert, I'm glad you could join us today on the old hot seat. Interesting timing to talk about some of the, the battle going on out there in terms of how the industry and indeed how Congress is going to view this space going forward. But before we go, Robert, I'd like to leave our audience wanting more so if you have any additional thoughts on the ongoing debate swirling out there in crypto have at it and also b if you'd like to leave our audience with any hints any teases of what's coming down the pike from you and the team at luca now is the time sir the floor is yours sure so i can't list list uh specific announcements but we do have some very exciting ones that are coming so i will just tease you a little bit um you know we're very excited i mean not just for us but for the whole industry um and uh, and so I look forward to sharing them. Um, and you can find Luca at uh, Luca.tech on our website. Feel free to contact us um, or, or follow us on, on LinkedIn or, or any of our platforms. There you go. Luca.tech is the place to go. And we have to keep on going right on into our next segment. It is time for the Bitcoin Breakdown. It's time to explore the latest trending activity, trends, and developments across the world's leading crypto market. It's time for the Bitcoin Breakdown. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Bitcoin Breakdown, the portion of the show where we do just that. We break down the action out there in the world's leading digital asset, which is, of course, Bitcoin, even though interesting. From Robert's data, it sounds like a lot more funds are starting to branch out beyond just your Bitcoin and your ETH. They're still the volume leaders, but interesting to hear that it's more of the minority of funds that are just trading those two and not also trading some interesting and indeed smaller altcoins. So that's always intriguing for us. See what's on the altcoin radar. Of course, we'll get out there in a little bit in the altcoin universe. But first, let's hang our hats in the big dog, which is Bitcoin a little bit of movement out there, a little bit of price action coming into today's show. We did see some interesting levels, about 48,000 and change. Of course, since then, it has kind of settled off back to pretty close to where it was on the end of our last show, net up about 315 handles from where it was this time last week. So right around a 46,000, a little bit north, almost 46,200 out there. We were just shy of 46,500 on our last show. So we had a little bit of vacillation, almost a 5,000 point range. We had about 43,000 on the dark side and about 48,000 and change on the upside over the course of the past week, but settling out pretty much right back where we were this time last week. As a result, Vol also coming in a bit this week as well. Last show, we were threatening to break into triple digits again at about 100, almost 100%, 96%. And coming into today's show, we're a wee bit below that, back down to 87%. In terms of BitVol, which is, of course, our friend Mr. Ho's Bitcoin VIX, effectively, it was at 110 last show, this show at 101. By the way, all these analytics, all these stats coming at you, courtesy of our friends over there in Genesis Volatility Land. Check them out for yourselves. GVOL.io is the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires out there. If you did so, you would also see that the skew on our last show was nearly a seven. So pretty positive. And this week has come in a bit down back to about a three or so. So coming in almost four points. There's about a 6.7 on last week's show. In terms of open interest, we are seeing that tick up if ever so slightly. Just a hair under 100,000 calls are open right now. 99,300 to be precise. That's up exactly 4,000 from this time last week. And the puts 52,500 up about 2,500. So we did see a lot of the puts come off, of course, with expiration and also as we saw the big sell-off 
going into April and May. People blew through their put strikes, so they wisely took them off. We haven't really seen a ton of that reestablishing yet. It's more people looks like positioning to recapture some of that upside out there. It'll be interesting to see as we start getting, you know, back up in these mid 40,000 levels and start threatening higher. If we start seeing some of those puts start to climb back up there again, in terms of where you folks are hanging out from an expiration perspective, we were talking about August, maybe fighting it into the front this week. And that didn't happen this week. Actually, it was September. So the first quarterly coming up that fought its way into the top spot this week. So Folks are still hanging out in the quarterlies. They just went to the first one they can get their hands on. SEP is up to about 45,300 contracts. Again, up about exactly 4,000 from this time. Last week, December number two, with a little bit shy of 45,000, about 44,600. It's up about 1,600 from this time last week. And August, bringing up the rear with about 28,400 contracts open. That's up a pretty strong 6,000 contracts, but not enough to take the top spot away from September and December. OI, again, we mentioned more contracts open this week. So we're seeing a little bit more on the notional value of that OI front. Last week, we were at about 6 billion open on Deribit and about close to 7 billion on the rest of the venues coming into today. Shows up about a billion. It's about 7 billion open on Deribit and close to 8 billion open on the rest of the venues. And if you're wondering where the number two is right now, it is Deribit. A distant number two, but still number two at 275 million. Then we actually have a tie for number three, both of them at 221 million between OKEX and bit.com. CME at number four with 193 million out there. So interesting. CME continuing uh, to bring up the rare out there. In terms of the volume that was actually going up on the big dog, which was Darabit, it wasn't a blow your doors off kind of week, but it was a decently active, decently steady week out there we had multiple days hitting the 800 to 900 million worth of notional value which is considering the lows we've seen recently that's actually decently impressive the most active day pretty much was our last show day august 9th with just a little bit shy of a billion worth of notional going up that day that was the most active day for the past week the rest were some days getting close to 900 the rest of the days maxing out around 800 something still you know not quite the two billion we saw not too long ago but also far above the couple of hundred million we were seeing just barely trickling along <laughs> for the better part of the last few months. Let's go out to the strikes and see where you folks are lining up. Where are the size positions right now in Bitcoin options? Well, let's find out. Number one, it's the 50,000 strike with about 9,000 contracts open. That drifted down about 500 last week, drifted down about 500 again this past week. So for the last two weeks, it's lost about 500 contracts a week, but it's still the number one with about 9,000 almost exactly open out there right now. So still good enough for number one. If that's not optimistic enough for you, though, listeners, don't worry, because number two is the 100,000 strike. Yes, we're back to that with about 8,000, almost 8,200. That's up about 600 or so from last week. And then number three, the 60,000 strike. So we're still hanging out in the optimistic range with about 8,200 open. That's down only a few hundred from last week. So kind of holding firm there. Number four, the 20,000 strike. Now a bit in the rearview mirror with about 7,100 contracts. That's down nearly 1,000 from this time last week. Uh, number five, we got a newcomer to the top five. It's the 80,000 strike. So if 60,000 wasn't optimistic enough for you and 100,000 was a bit of a bridge too far, there you go. Goldilocks, 80,000 strike with about 6,200 contracts and rounding out the top Actually, I take it back. We're going to add a top six this week, listeners, because number six is a doozy. <laughs> so if the 50,000 strike didn't do it for you, 60,000, 80,000, let's say even the 100,000 strike, you said to yourself, self, that's not enough optimism for me to express in the crypto landscape right now. I need to go above and beyond. Where could I go? Could I perhaps interest you in the 200,000 strike? Because yes, it is open for a fair amount of size. 5,900 contracts are open on the 200,000 strike. So I have to imagine a lot of those are the selling end of some sort of vertical. I would have to hope. I can't imagine there's a lot of opening buying paper on the 200,000 strike. But you never know, given what we've seen in the crypto space. Crazier things have happened. So we wanted to squeeze that in as a fun number six. Yes, the 200,000 strike is now on our radar, listeners. Read into that what you will. We mentioned CME earlier. Not a ton of paper over the course of the past week. The busiest day was our last show day, August 9th, with about almost 100 contracts. You might say, oh, big whoop, 100 contracts. That's about 500 with the multiplier. And again, it's a pretty beefy contract. But yeah, still not a lot of paper out there. The OI, if you're wondering, on the big contracts over there at CME, 819. It's up a few, about 60-odd or so 
from last week. So slowly growing, but not exactly blowing the doors off. Same deal on the futures front. We used to do regularly 20 plus thousand contracts a day. These days, pretty much every day last week was 8,000 contracts or below. Uh, the OI has ticked up a bit, though, up, up to about 7,200, up about 700 contracts from last week. Uh, micro Bitcoin futures, that's kind of where it seems like a lot of you are interested. And in. the OI and the volume has remained relatively steady out there. 16,000 contracts coming into today's show. We've seen that number a lot of late. In fact, that's pretty much what the OI is as well. The OI is 15,800, up a few hundred from last week. So it seems like a decent clip out there on the micro futures. And again, as more of you, Given what we just talked about with the folks at Luca, how reporting and taxing and everything else is going to become more of an issue going forward, it seems like, in this space. Maybe more of you will be intrigued by a centrally cleared place where you get reporting and everything else. And it seems like micro futures are leading the way in that vanguard. Now it's time to see what's leading the way for the rest of the space. It is time to explore the altcoin universe. It's time to move beyond Bitcoin and find out what's moving the rest of the crypto marketplace. It's time to boldly venture into the altcoin universe. All right, everybody, welcome to the altcoin universe, the portion of the show where we explore beyond the big dog that is Bitcoin. Explore some Ethan. See what else is lighting up our tapes out here. Coming into showtime, we have seen ETH pretty much hovering, giving up a little bit. Uh, since our last show, last show, we were at about a 3,200 and change this week, 3,162 coming into showtime. So giving up about, let's say about 60 odd handles or so. But other than that, not a heck of a lot going on out there. We did see it briefly dip below the 3,000 level, 2,982. But that's about as low as we got. So it's like about a close to 400 point range on ETH this week. As we mentioned with Bitcoin, when kind of net on the week, you're kind of settling out pretty much at the same level. You're going to see vol coming in. That's pretty much what we saw in ETH as well. On our last show, it was looking pretty robust at about 115%. Today's show, it's still north of the triple digit level, just ever so barely, 104%. Skew wise, we saw on our last show, 8.3. And coming into today's show, 8.3. So not a lot of change out there, listeners. In terms of action on the notional volume front, not the busiest day or really week either. The busiest day we had was August 13th with a little over 300 million lighting it up. Again, a far cry from the 1B levels we saw not too long ago back in April and May. Let's look what's going on from an OI perspective. Actually seeing some decent growth out there this week. Again, kind of like Bitcoin, it's almost 2x calls to puts out there right now. Calls have about 815,000 contracts, opens up about 34,000 from this time last week. And the puts have about 432,000 contracts open. It's up about 12,000 from last week. Same deal. Now that we're kind of getting back into some more lofty price levels for ETH, it'll be interesting to see if we start seeing that put OI start to catch up. With the calls, or if it remains all calls all the time, most of the leading crypto assets longer term tend to be call biased. We'll see now if in the near term, some of that maybe hedging activity could catch up to it as well. In terms of the notional value of what's open out there, like we said, we have seen the OI grow a little bit, but overall, it's pretty much about the same as it was last week. About $4 billion worth of notional OI was open last week, and this week, about $4 billion. So not a lot of change out there. Let's see if the expiration cycle in terms of where you folks are lining up your trades, if that has changed a bit since last week. And looks like it's still pretty much a decent lead in the dance out there with 415,000 contracts. It's up nearly 20,000 from this time last week, followed by number two, September, 297,000 contracts open. That's up about 9,000. August is doing its best to catch up. It's at 203,000 right now, up 32,000. So gained a pretty impressive clip this past week, but not sure if that's going to be enough to take the number one spot by the time it rolls off the board. Uh, speaking of the board, let's see where the largest open positions are right now in ETH options. Is it as crazy as outlandish as what we saw in Bitcoin? Well, let's find out. Number one strike right now in terms of the largest open position in ETH options is the 5,000 strike with nearly 86,000 contracts open. That's up about 9,200 or so from this time last week. So a lot of positioning around the 5,000 strike, even though we hang around in this, you know, 32 to 3,400 range for the better part of the week. Uh, Number two 
getting optimistic again. You got the 10,000 strike with 53,300 contracts open. That's, that's up 8,300 from this time last week. So a lot more new positioning going on on the 10,000 strike. What do you think about that, listeners? You think 10,000 strike? Is that a bridge too far, a little bit too optimistic? You think it's mostly maybe the other side, maybe some 5,000, 10,000 verticals going up? What are your thoughts on some of these more, shall we say, outlandish strikes? Hit us up. Let us know. Number three, 4,000 strike with about 47,800, about 6,000 from last week. And the bottom half of our top five got some newcomers. Number four is the 6,000 strike, breaking in with about 39,500 contracts open now. And number five, Again, kind of splitting the uprights there. 4,000, 6,000, 5,000 weren't enough for you, but 10,000, a bit of a bridge too far. Well, here comes the 8,000 strike with about 38,100 contracts open. Again, a newcomer to our top five. So you got an interesting pretty much call strip <laughs> there in the top five there. Uh, the lowest strike is the 4,000 strike, which still has a bit to go to even break through that one. So again, one of the reasons why calls continue to outnumber the puts in the ETH options. Intriguing stuff. What are your thoughts on these strikes here, listeners? Let us know. ETH futures, similar story. They're still kind of a bit of a beefy product. I think they're waiting for a micro out there as well. Doing, let's see, looks like about 3,300 contracts. So not terrible for a pretty beefy name, but again, not blowing the doors off. The OIs are at a similar level, about 3,900 contracts. That's up ever so slightly from this time last week. Before we roll out of the altcoin universe, let's look really quickly at some of the other names you folks like to watch out there this week. XRP getting quite the lift. My goodness, up nearly 50%. Actually, it is up pretty much 50%. It was almost 80 cents exactly. So it was actually 82 cents. So just under 50% on the week. That's impressive. Coming into today's show, 123. So up 40, almost 41 cents. Nearly exactly 50%. My goodness. A good run here. Or XRP, obviously some ups. I know a lot of you have been frustrated with the lack of availability of it on certain major platforms. Uh, perhaps this pop will maybe indicate that maybe, again, we've said this many times, so it's kind of hard to read too much into it, but maybe perhaps this pop will indicate that some of the issues are behind it. We shall see Bitcoin Cash up nearly 100 points from last week, about 93, and Bitcoin SV up about 18 bucks from this time last week. And you heard our guest talk about it. Good old Doge up seven cents. From this time last week, let's see, where was it hanging out coming into showtime? 33.6 cents. Looks like Mark Cuban now getting into the fray. So if you if you weren't upset enough by all these kind of peripheral crypto players chiming in and driving all these various altcoin to crazy levels like your Musks and everyone else, here comes Mark Cuban now. <laughs> As he came out and said, he thinks Dogecoin is the strongest cryptocurrency when it comes to making actual purchases and he said that his Mavericks team is going to accept Dogecoin for ticket and merchandise sales. So there you go. That's all it really takes. I mean, it's a negligible market. How many people are actually buying Mavericks merchandise with Dogecoin? But there you go. Just that headline enough to drive uh, that. Of course, Elon Musk, easy for me to say. <laughs> Couldn't let that go without uh, also commenting that he agrees. So there you go. That combo was enough. I know this kind of stuff. This kind of peripheral noise drives a lot of the diehards in the crypto space pretty much up a wall. And this kind of stuff really shouldn't have the impact that it does, but it still does. And so for now, especially for a name like Dogecoin, which you can argue most crypto assets don't really have any fundamental or expected value. But Dogecoin literally began as a joke. So it's probably still going to be buffeted by these waves of the Internet for some time to come. But there you go. If you're out there hodling in Doge, a good week for you. You've got questions about crypto. Who doesn't? It's time to find out the answers to your crypto questions. All right, everybody. Time to wrap things up in our crypto questions segment. Wanted to put a little poll out there for you so you folks can play along. A lot of you liked our questions of the weeks that we do on social media, predominantly on Twitter. They wanted us to bring it back for a while now. We have done so, had some hot and heavy action over the last couple of weeks on our questions of the week. This one also crosses over into the crypto realm, which is why I wanted to make sure you folks on this show were aware of it as well. If you want to see it for yourself, head on over to at options on Twitter and make your voice heard. Our question of the week this week. Now, everyone has vol on the brain these days, but which product holds the volatility crown? Quite simply, 
Which of these has the highest 30-day at the money volatility? And no cheating, no pulling it up on your brokerage platform. Use your gut. What does your gut tell you? You gave you four choices. Bitcoin, obviously. Uh, VIX, so volatility itself. I know that's a bit of a meta concept. The volatility of volatility. Woo, crazy. <laughs> Listen to our Volview show if that confuses you. Well, that's an interesting one to put in there as well. And crude oil, getting out in the commodity space. And to wrap it up, we just talked about Mr. Musk through some Tesla in there as well. And I'll give you an early preview. Right now, Bitcoin is leading the dance with nearly two-thirds of the voting. But again, it just went live before showtime. You have the rest of this week to make your voice heard out there. At Options is the place to go. And we have to go right on out of here, listeners. But make sure if you are in the Secret Handshake Club, we'll see you there tomorrow, 1 p.m. Central, to break down all your questions with the director of risk himself, all your questions about trade structure, risk management, how should you really trade these things, how these products really trade in these crazy market conditions where things are bouncing up and down. You're thinking about maybe buying a put to hedge your portfolio. How does that really work? How does that work when this pandemic's buffeting these markets and everything else like that? He's a great guy to answer those questions. If you're not part of that secret club yet and you want to join, have the fun there as well as our Options Oddity Show and all the other programs we do throughout the week coming at you, you know where to go. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go. And we'll see you in there. See you tomorrow for the pro Q&A session later on this week throughout all the rest of our shows. Remember, if any of these topics we're talking about here are a little bit confusing to you from an options perspective, make sure you check out the rest of our educational content on the network, including Options Bootcamp and Options Playbook Radio, two great starting points for anyone out there who's a little bit concerned or confused with these terms like volatility and skew and everything else like that. We'll walk you through all that in a lot more detail, and then we'll see you back here next week, another episode of the Crypto Rundown. This program is brought to you by Genesis Volatility, also known as GVOL, home of institutional grade crypto options analytics. Whether you're trading CFI options or DeFi options, cryptocurrencies move. Use GVOL analytics to analyze implied volatility, model realized volatility, structure positions, and unlock alpha. For more information, visit GVOL.io. That's G V O L.io. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com.